All right, hopefully everybody got their coffee and we got some high energy. Remember, JP wants an interactive uh, for his second time in front of you guys. So when you're thinking about this, don't think safety presentation like on an airplane, boring, you're not even paying attention. Think like emergency slide, we're all in it together. Okay. A little bit. I'm, I'm going, I'm going, all right. Mr. Travis, I can get you to come back up here again. You're doing such a fine job. Everybody, round of applause for Mr. Travis. Thank you, sir. All right, as we talked about previously, we talked about landing phase considerations. Now we're actually going to go into the nuts and bolts of this whole thing. Next slide, please. All right, introductions and pitfalls, landing distance factors, stabilized approach concepts, site picture correlations, flare and rollout, the most critical part of it. And again, Q&A. And this time, the Q&A is for everybody. You can ask me anything you want. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be about Honda Jet related stuff. It could be why the sky is blue. What is my favorite color? And what is my favorite heavy metal band? It doesn't matter. You can ask whatever you want. Next slide, please. All right, uh, introduction and pitfalls. Why the Honda is truly unlike any aircraft that's ever been built before. That is a very true statement. Next slide. All right. Why is the Honda so tricky to land, and thereby making it one of the most enjoyable airplanes to land? Uh, if you start clicking, it should. All right, here we go. Honda Jet has three large vertical, uh, vertical surface areas on the aircraft. You have the vertical stabilizer, you have the winglets, and then you have the engine pylons. All of these things act as sails or areas for wind to grab, especially in crosswind conditions. Low wing clearance. Uh, the wing comes up to right about here on me, and I am vertically challenged, so it's right here to hip height. Makes crosswinds very difficult because I'm not able to get more into the side, and it's shorter wings as well, right? Wait times arm equals moment. There's this whole thing in physics called leverage. Sometimes we don't have all the leverage we need. Another thing is the trailing link landing gear. The pilots in here, especially the Honda type guys, how many of you have landed it so smoothly you can hardly tell you were on the ground? Every now and then you get one. Every now and then, right? Right? Come up and get you. But here's the thing. When you first touch down and you get on it, there's a teeter-totter type effect. And you'll feel the aircraft doing one of these numbers as soon as you touch down. Narrow wheelbase can lead to a lack of stability between uh, main landing gear and the rest of the aircraft. World War II tail draggers. How many of you are familiar with the ME-109? The Mr. Spent 109. The gear fell from the side of the wings, came inboard for a narrow, very narrow gear base. The Spitfire, very similar concept. F4F Wildcat. All of it was centered near the fuselage rather than the outboard of the wings. Then the FW-190 came out. This one had the gear land outboard out onto the wings for a much wider wheelbase, much easier time controlling the airplane. We have high pressure on a small surface area tire. Uh, so again, small tires, high pressure. Contact is gonna be very finicky unless it's firmly established. So here we are. This aircraft must be flown to a stop. Now you take a look here. This is an aircraft short final about ready to land. Everybody notice something here too, that if we look closely, the trailing link is fully extended both on the main landing gear right here and also right here in the nose. And uh, Mike, uh, how far down would you say the, the landing gear is extended? Does it go down about what, three feet, something like that? I'm guessing here, I don't know, but that's a lot of area for that gear to compress to actually establish if you're on the ground or not and firmly contact it. Next slide, please. All right, common threads with most Honda Jet incidents and accidents. Accidents, excuse me. Uh, Sources of NTSB accident investigation reports. I was high and fast on final. We've all been there, I've been there. However, I've gotten it slowed down in enough time for us to be stable. I had excessive float down the runway, which is another big problem in an aircraft where runway 
Landing distance available is a premium. And then the last one, I went to engage the brakes and I felt nothing. They failed to understand how the anti-skid system works or how the aircraft behaves on a wet surface. Next slide, please. All right, landing distance factors. It's straight out of the AFM, by the way. Current AFM from Honda. Next slide. All right. Honda has allocated two separate pages in Chapter 4, several cautions and warnings about crosswind capability of the aircraft. This is the only aircraft that at the time, uh, and then when the Elite 2 came out, it went to a demonstrated, but everything else prior to that was a hard limitation of 20 knots crosswind. Velado has actually adopted that across all different variants of the Honda in order to, A, uh, keep everything standardized on one specific standard rather than, all right, it's an Elite 2, you can do the demonstrated numbers. We don't want to do that. Um, second page has a bunch of notes. We'll cover all of those as well. This is just a bare minimum coming from the OEM, the manufacturer. This is the, the, these are your warning labels that you should take heed to. However, uh, pilots should also add a little bit more to that. Uh, rule of thumb with regulations and everything is you can add to, but you can't take away. And that's where we bring things in uh, regarding safeguards with wet runways, high crosswinds, et cetera. We'll get a little bit more into detail about how we operate with our SOP. However, on the crosswind procedures, let's talk a little bit about this. Takeoffs and landings on contaminated runways have significant additional risk due to the varied surface conditions likely to be encountered. Caution for takeoffs and landings on wet or icy runways, the maximum crosswind capability may be significantly reduced due to the reduced steering authority contributed by the nose wind. <laughs> Operations with any tailwind component in conjunction with crosswinds, often referred to as a quartering tailwind, should be avoided due to the inherent hazard of operating on such runways. And last caution, large and prompt aileron or rudder pedal inputs may be required in crosswind conditions close to or exceeding the maximum allowable crosswinds or in gusty conditions. What's everybody's thoughts reading these cautions right now about this aircraft? Just throw the first thing that comes to your mind, and this goes for everybody. So somebody doesn't want to land in crosswinds. There's one. Throw out what you're first thinking about when you're, when you're, when you're listening to how I'm reading this. What does this appear to you? Like I said, this goes for everybody in the audience. Tell me the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear this. And everybody's all quiet. Okay, right. Well, you're also ex-military, so you understand the caution notes and warning system too. But, you know, it is a pay attention to it. This is just like, hey, I, I've never seen two pages dedicated to the crosswind capability of an aircraft. Most aircraft have just one little blurb saying this is our max demonstrated crosswind. They don't have a preferred crosswind landing technique. However, we go into that. Here we go into the notes. Lateral control during the ground roll has been shown to be relatively ineffective in countering wing rocking motions, which may occur after touchdown of one main gear prior to the opposite main gear. Use steady upwind aileron input to maintain gear firmly in contact with the ground rather than attempting a counter rocking motion. Approximately two seconds after the nose wheel has registered weight on wheels, the nose wheel steering becomes active and the steering will move to the position being commanded by the rudder pedals. This transition may induce a yawing response, which should be promptly countered by rudder inputs. Rudder and nose wheel steering are significantly more effective in maintaining directional control than differential braking. In addition, the amount of available differential braking may be reduced if any skid is active. And then lastly, the contribution to directional stability for the main wheels is reduced with increased braking. Directional control is in question. Release of brakes apply rudder as required or correct. Once directional control has been reestablished, apply symmetrical braking. Anybody in here been to a performance driving course before, whether through law enforcement, Skip Barber, Bob Bondurant, et cetera? All right, I'm going to pick on Mike back here because I like to pick on Mike. What's the rule about tires? 
Are tires able to do uh, multiple things at one time, or can they do one thing at one time? Okay, so let's say in a car, front engine, rear wheel, right? Just for weight distribution purposes, et cetera. Has a tendency to oversteer, right? What's the big thing about going into a sharp turn beforehand? We want to stop straight ahead before we start inputting our, our turn to it. Same thing on the Honda, okay? We need to get all that deceleration in, but if we're trying to do more directional control than we are braking, it's not gonna be able to do both. You can do one or you can do the other. One of the big things that I stress to people, how many in here believe that you're a lousy pilot if you can't land on center line? Show of hands, just. If you cannot, if you come into a landing and you're three feet off center line, does that make you a lousy pilot? Okay. How many of you would try to eventually correct back to center line after touchdown? Okay. And if I said there's difficulty trying to get back to center line, what are you going to do? Are you just going to maintain that parallel track with the center line? That's what I'd do. There's that common misconception out there that you must be on center line at all times. I disagree. Only for the Of course, uh, <laughs> if you're flying with Steve. Okay. So if I'm paralleling that center line track then, am I directly in line with the runway? Oh, okay, so we're good to go. So I don't have to worry about getting on center line. Unless you need the wing clearance. Okay, well, yeah, that's a different story too. But I'm glad that everybody agrees that I don't have to immediately fight back to center line. I think this is just anecdotal only, in my opinion, and I think that has been an also a contributing factor, is over-controlling trying to get back to that. I saw an accident report that said the pilot contributed to the force. Yeah. Well, yeah. That sounds about right. I mean, we, we have... Pilot-induced oscillations, they happen on the runway, right? The other thing, again, we're going back to technique. That is one of the big things that we stress here at Velado, and then I harp on our training captains quite a bit. Make sure you're teaching the difference between SOP, aircraft manufacturer's recommendations and or limitations, and then technique, and not blurring those lines between them because I have had pilots before tell me that this is, this is a limitation. We come to find out it was an SOP only and is actually something we added. I said, you have to be careful with that. We make these things abundantly clear to make sure everybody is operating off the right set of information. That is a huge, huge emphasis on why we teach and why we go so far into this. So, to add to this and why I'm bringing this up, every brand new typed pilot in the aircraft gets 25 hours of supervised operating experience with an experienced Honda Jet captain. Our current count is at 12 training captains right now and a combined collective experience of 15,000 or 16,000 hours in the Honda. We do have a little bit of a round table exercise every now and then. We're about to have another one on Monday. Uh, again, talking about fuel and a few other training things. But with that collective experience, we pass that on to our newly typed guys. And there have been a few that um, just haven't made it and we give them a little bit of time. We've also had others recognize they may be getting out of their depth and they've respect or they've requested to stay as SIC, um, which we've also done. Uh, the big thing is, is during the training, right? Everybody. Uh, Flight instructors, you're exempt out of this one, so if you're a flight instructor and hold that rating, don't answer this question. Who's heard of the law of primacy before? Flight instructors are exempt. So, anybody want to take a stab at it before 
I have somebody actually answer it. From fundamentals of instruction. Yeah. It is from the fundamentals of instruction. Okay, primacy is a law that says the first thing remembered is the one best retained, or the first thing learned is the one that is retained the most. Simply put, garbage in, garbage out. We don't want to be teaching garbage. We teach quality, and that's why we do the OE. And we try and handle uh, some of these bad habits that we like to see. Uh, prime example, we have airline guys that want to come and they want to taxi 15 feet past the center line and then bring it back around. And I'm like, dude, the center line's right there. <laughs> Just turn. <laughs> um, but we try and break people those bad habits. And then by the end of 25 hours, we ensure that they're able to land the aircraft through most ranges of different landing conditions that they're going to go over. The big thing is Honda has made it abundantly clear that on crosswinds, these are the steps and factors you need to be aware of before you take it into these conditions. Flight safety covers this. I know us as an operator, we cover it. Honda has covered it. This has been covered time and time again. This is why we emphasize on it so much. Next slide, please. Okay. Continuing on with more stuff from Honda. Honda actually has a lot of really good information in the AFM. Just got to know where to look for it. Following information from the AFM regarding wet surface conditions. 30% is a rather, rather large increase regarding total landing distance. For example, if those predicated numbers, if I go into my CDU and I type in my landing performance numbers, it says I'm going to require 3,800 feet of runway to stop. And then I take the guidance out of chapter four that says 30%, I've now gone from 3,800 to almost 5,000 feet, 5,940 feet. Part 135 regulations tell us we have to be able to stop within 60% of available landing distance unless you're eligible on demand and then you can go to an 80% rule. In any case, if this was performed on a wet 5,000 foot strip, that is a 40 foot margin of error with 4,900, or excuse me, 60 feet margin of error with 4,940 feet. Because of this required distance at Velado, what we have done is we have a blanket policy. If it's dry runway, it's 5,000 feet. If it's wet, 6,000. And then APG is going to give us more information too that's probably going to say 6,000 may not even be enough. I don't think uh, OCC, have we ran into that before? where even APG says 6,000 isn't enough yet on a wet runway. I don't think we've seen it yet, but that 6,000 foot number seems to be the good middle of the road approach there. The reason these are highlighted in red is this is gonna refer back to our appendix on runway handling characteristics and our SOP related to the Honda jet. Here it is right out of the AFM. For a wet runway, both takeoff and landing, it's 30%. Period, 30%. Next page, please. Okay, this right here comes straight out of APG, by the way. So those of you looking at iGenesis pre-flight, here you go. This is a takeoff, or this is a landing report. And uh, where was this going into? BGM, I'm not sure of that. Oh, Binghamton, New York. You're actually gonna see pictures of that airport today. Gives us a landing distance available with the slope, our flaps, weather, crosswind and headwind, dry, anti off. The captain is not a high minimums captain. He's not restricted under eligible on demand, therefore he could land with the 80%. You have our landing weight, the speeds, landing distance, factored landing distance of 4,198 feet, and then a missed approach climb gradient. Anybody been to Binghamton, New York before? It's actually, it's pretty, hill. well, I, Josh, I know you have. <laughs> you hail from that area, right? Okay, it's actually pretty hilly out there. It's really beautiful, too. Uh, there is terrain out there, which is why it's a 7.4. All right, 14 CFR 91.103 states that pilots will become familiar with the following. Note that this is 91. Go forward. Each pilot in command shall, before the beginning of a flight, become familiar with all available information concerning that flight. This information must include 
For a flight under IFR or a flight not in the vicinity of an airport, weather reports, forecasts, fuel requirements, alternates or alternatives available. If the planned flight cannot be completed and any known traffic delays of which the pilot command has been advised of ATC. That pretty much sums up our first presentation in one line, does it not? Keep going. For any flight, runway lengths at airports of intended use and the following takeoff and landing distance information. Continue. For civil aircraft for which an improved airplane or rotorcraft flight manual containing takeoff and landing distance data is required, the takeoff and landing distance data contained therein, meaning chapter five of the Honda AFM, continue. Oh, hang on, there we go. For civil aircraft other than those specified, paragraph B1 of this section, other reliable information appropriate to the aircraft related to aircraft performance under expected values of airport elevation, runway slope, gross weight, wind, and temperature. Continue. All right, head back real fast. So all of this right here match most of parts uh, 91, 103, B1, and 2. Is there any question about what APG spits out? So let me ask another question. If this came out and said you're not able to do it, would you still depart and go to that airport? Show of hands, everybody in here, would any of you go? It's a giant red flag. And I'll actually show up, you won't even be able to produce this screen if you're not able to get a valid solution set. The CDU on the Honda works very similar. It'll flash yellow and say landing not able, or it's, um, yeah, landing distance, uh, landing distance not available or exceeded landing distance. The Honda warns you, you're not able to do it. Nine times out of 10 when I have done that, it's been operator error. I'll be the first to tell you I'm guilty of it. But there are other times where it's like, oh my gosh, we're not gonna be able to do this, why not? So we have to follow that rabbit hole. Next slide, please. All right, we talked about Mulatto added safeguards. We have taken manufacturer specific data, or excuse me, restrictions, and added to it. It has worked very well for us thus far. We insist on including this in all of our materials and ensure all departments across the company are harmonized to these, excuse me, these standards. Azim will reference that a little bit later on in his portion. Pat also references this with his safety stuff. It's a baseline expectations for all stakeholders as well as our pilots. This furthers our commitment, Volato's commitment to operating within the highest degrees of safety. And if we look, uh, this part of the SOP was written by yours truly and it was proofed by Mr. Josh Newsetter, our Director of Operations, and Mr. Azim Sumar, our VP of Standards. So we've had three very experienced pilots take a look at this, vet it, and make sure it makes sense. A lot of Honda jets have unique ground handling performance that can predicate numbers or lack thereof for landing at intended destinations. While Velado has operated with these numbers before, it is far more appropriate to place this section in the SOP than the GOM because we do operate more than just the Honda. However, by and large, the Honda is our single biggest type that we have at the entire fleet. These numbers refer to landing distances only, whereas takeoff is subject to the ability to meet accelerate stop numbers. Should there be any ability for the aircraft to not meet these requirements, PIC will contact our OCC, we discuss options. Volato shall not argue with performance limiting numbers. We don't argue it. We don't even try and push it. If there's flags telling us we can't go, we seek alternatives to where we can go and we stay safe. For flights into normal airports, as you noticed, max crosswind components, 20 knots all Honda series. 5,000 foot landing distance available dry, 6,000 wet. We also take the RCAM measurements or field condition measurements, 444 or less is not authorized for landing. We won't go. See the chart excerpt below for acceptable crosswind limitations. Next slide, please. This was a chart that Josh came up with. It has worked well for being able to determine whether or not we're going to be able to make it into an airport. Our example here is a 90 foot wide runway. We've determined that our max acceptable crosswind component is 18 knots with a gust component of 12. 
The wind in this example is reported at 300 at 20 gusts 28, landing runway 27. Dimensions are an 8,000 foot runway by 90 feet wide. And it's a 30 degree offset from right to left. Crosswind component is calculated at 10 knots. Acceptable as this is less than 18. The chart will get you what your max limits are. Your actual weather will tell you if you're gonna be in our safe zone. Gust component is calculated as 14 knots, not acceptable because it's more than 12. We can't land because the 12 knot max gust component limit is exceeded. Again, we went back and talked about how tricky this aircraft is in crosswind conditions. Why are we gonna push it when we already have tricky windy conditions already? This chart allows the crew to make the safe decision and not attempt the approach and landing and head to a near suitable alternate, thereby removing the risk and putting them into a phone booth where they feel that landing is the safest outcome possible. Next slide, please. All right, Certi certification versus regulation. This is one of my favorite phrases. I'm sure it's caused some consternation before. I'm gonna say it again, just because something is legal does not make it smart. Certification standards are conducted in a highly structured routine environment to create data, baselines, and limitations. These are derivatives of an exhaustive testing regime do not exceed limitations. We all agree that we're not gonna exceed limitations, right? Nobody is gonna exceed limitations. If the limitations of other safeguards should fail, owner operators, pilots, and organizations should look at increasing their restrictions in order to ensure a safe outcome to the flight. And then again, we go back to the six Ps, prior proper planning prevents poor performance. Next slide, please. All right, stabilized approach concept. When going around, or when not to is appropriate. Before we get into this, so head back real quick. Can anybody in here think of a time where going around is actually unsafe compared to landing? Terrain. 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 Aspen. Anybody? Well, you're gonna land. <laughs> no more fuel. How about there's a level five precipitation cell three miles off the end of the runway? Wind shear, okay. There's several examples when going around isn't the safest option. That's where it becomes incumbent on the pilot in command to make that call. All right, next slide. All right. How many agree with this principle that a good approach begins with a good brief? Everybody agree to that? Okay. Stabilized approach begins at the approach brief. What we do is we do it just prior to the top of descent and we look at everything, the star, the approach, where we're landing at, intended taxi path, factors, threats, terrain, any performance uh, inhibiting capability, i.e. if our anti-skid was in up or something of that nature. We go over it all just prior to descent. Stabilized approach is not a singular decision. If I think I'm stabilized, but my pilot monitoring, let's say uh, Azim is in the aircraft with me, and he says, dude, you're not stabilized. What do you mean? I'm right there. This is off. Glide slope is not coincident with the ILS signal. It doesn't matter, you're unstabilized, go around. It's not meant to be an argument. Somebody says unstable, go around, that's it. We're going around, it's not to be argued with. Especially not in a landing phase where time is of the essence. Short final at 200 feet crossing the airport fence is not the time to be getting into an argument with somebody. Get in the air, clean the aircraft up, be at a safe altitude, then discuss if you must. Or save it for the hotel bar. That's what I recommend. Standardizing all approaches, IFR and VFR. I back things up with an ILS. Even if I'm not flying a full ILS approach, common one is going into Mather, Sacramento, they're usually landing west, but they're gonna bring me in on a left downwind to the outside runway, 28 left. I still have the ILS needles up. I'm gonna turn my base to final from 1500 feet, make my way in, and I'm still gonna be landing on a stabilized approach. Glide slope centered up, localizer centered up, on ref, fully configured, engine spooled up, that's a big one. 
Gears down and locked. Landing checklist is complete. Providing extra clues to ensure stability. So we talk about backing everything up with an instrument approach. Environmentals, wind, rain, visibility. How many of you have flown into Centennial before? Okay, there's a big old reservoir right out the north end of the field, right? You know when the winds are ripping because you can see it on the water. That's usually a good clue to see what the winds are doing. But if I see ripple, clear, ripple, clear, I have a pretty good indication I'm about to hit some pretty gnarly crosswinds. Look at your external clues. Look at the dust. Look at the wind sock. Look at all the factors that are out there to determine, all right, where are we at? How many of you in crosswind conditions would let the autopilot do all the work to short final? Like at 50 feet. How many of you would click it off at 1,000 and hand fly it? I'd want to feel it for 50. Everybody would want to feel it. I like it. All right, good. Well, we're all on the same page there. This is a good start. Stopping distance, right? Our CDU. If I'm going down and I'm coming down an approach and I notice that the winds are looking a lot nastier than 200 at 4, turn that radio on, go to VHF 2 or I pull the ATIS again and now it's saying it's 220 at 15 gust 22. Holy crap, that changes the calculus. It changes our decision making matrix. We have to keep backing everything up. And when in doubt, let's go back, back it up again. Redundancy is the thing. Remember, when in doubt, go around 250 pounds of jet fuel is minuscule to the cost compared to an accident, incident, or worse, fatality. Our stabilized approach, this is straight out of our SOP. Azim was the one that wrote this one. We have left it relatively unchanged. Following guidance provides a standardized method of determining when a go around and miss approach is appropriate. An approach is considered stabilized when all the final criteria are met. This is also a, a big thing for the FAA when they sit in on observations. When I was doing my initial type ride, Mr. Steve Brady was actually observing the training center examiner giving me the type. This is actually a debrief item for us. We talked about it, all right? All briefings and checklists have been completed. The aircraft is on the correct flight path. There are three runways at Memphis, 18 left, 18 center, 18 right. If my guidance is set up for 18 left, but I'm pointed at 18 right, something isn't right. Okay, that's what we mean by correct flight path. Only small changes in heading and pitch are required to maintain the correct flight path. The aircraft speed is not more than targeted airspeed plus 10 knots and not less than target airspeed minus five knots. Momentary deviations expected, okay? The aircraft is in the correct landing configuration. Sink rate is no greater than 1,000 feet per minute. If an approach requires a sink rate greater than 1,000 feet per minute, the target sink, rank, target sink rate as briefed in the approach briefing will be the maximum sink rate. Off the top of everybody's head, what are some areas where the, the descent rate is gonna be greater than 1,000 feet per minute? One of them starts with an A. Aspen. How many of you have been into Eagle? San Diego. That's another one. Okay. Thrust setting is appropriate for the aircraft configuration is not at idle power. The criteria will be met and checked by the following windows. A thousand AGL if the weather is at or below a thousand and three. So a thousand foot ceilings, three miles visibility. 500 AGL if the weather is above 1003 VFR. 300 feet AGL in the VFR pattern or during a circling approach. If an approach becomes unstable below these altitudes, the crew will initiate a go around and missed approach. It may not be possible to achieve stabilized approach criteria during certain types of approaches. Emergency procedures, steep approaches and arrivals. In these cases, time permitting the PIC will thoroughly brief go around considerations for the approach to be flown. In no case will pilots attempt to save or salvage a poor approach unless the possibility of a go around presents a greater risk than continuing to land. Which is why we talked about winter sometimes it's not safe to go around. Again, technique only. I fly all of my approaches at 120 knots, 51 to 55% M1, and I keep that stabilized. It minimizes pitch oscillations on the approach. 
It keeps us stable. It really keeps the, com uh, the pastors comfortable in the back. And I'm going to know if I'm going to start seeing trends. I'll be able to see the airspeed vector trending in a way I don't want it to go. Again, we talked about it earlier. When are these landing numbers accurate? When do they count? 50 feet over the threshold, fully configured, ready to land. So if I'm flying at 120 knots down the approach, am I still flying a stabilized approach? Again. If I'm flying 120 knots, what's our usual ref speed in a Honda at landing? 104. 104. So if I'm flying at 120 knots, am I flying unsafe? Am I flying a stabilized approach? Well, you are, but you have to ensure that you get the speed off of the 50 foot threshold. All right. So keep that in mind. 51 to 55 percent and one, 120 knots. Crossing the airport fence, you start walking the power back. By the time you hit the thresher, you go at full idle and you're right on ref. Keep the nose pointed at the runway. Wait until the touchdown zone markers, or excuse me, the aiming point markers are hitting the corner of the glare shields. Start your flare. Consistent every time. We'll go into more about this with the sight picture correlations here in a minute. Next slide, please, Mr. Travis. Zoom for emphasis. Okay. Stabilized approaches provide the following benefits. Go ahead. It's close to accurate reference to the demonstrating landing numbers, right? Because again, we just talked about it, 50 feet over the threshold on ref. Minimizes the amount of flow and time in the flare. Why is that important? Well, we talked about it earlier. For every XYZ of speed, you lose XYZ of landing distance. Ensures consistent handling throughout the whole landing phase. Next one. Ability to recognize adverse trends before it's too late to take appropriate action, thereby you're in the phone booth and you're out of options, and now you're putting yourself in an unsafe situation. Head back, please. If you take a look here, you have your localizer signal and your localizer path right here. They're slightly left, of course. They're slightly below glide path. They're at 600 feet. You can see the velocity vector is pointing just slightly off the runway. So I'm sure they're about ready to start making the right correction back. You can see the flight director right here telling them to turn right to get back on course. And they're at 116 knots with a rev speed of, we'll call that 112. So if I was at 120 knots, I'm still ref within 10, correct? Next. All right. Begin incorporating these ideas into your operations. This is for everybody, particularly the pilots. We have the entire arrival phase from start of approach, rollout, taxi, prior to descent from cruise. Don't be surprised. Surprise is not a fun word in the cockpit. Excuse me, flight deck. Come familiar with the local area. Have an alternate airport within easy flying distance in case of increased landing distance factors. Show vans, how many different airports are here in the Colorado area they, within five, minute, uh, five minutes of flying time? Right here, where we're at right now. Denver, Centennial, Rocky Mountain is right here. Colorado Springs to the south, it's all right there. This only works if you, the pilot, continue to incorporate this in every flight and every decision you make. Leave yourself outs. Give yourself alternatives. Next. All right, side picture correlation, lady and airplane using a wheelbarrow are identical. All right. Elements of proper side picture. We're going back to the basics. Alignment, center line alignment could give you an indication of crosswind. Attitude, ensuring proper control inputs given current conditions. Airspeed, throttle control, stabilized approach equals consistent airspeed. Stressing this again, do not stop flying the airplane. This aircraft must be an airplane that has flown to a complete stop. Maintain the inputs until the aircraft is at a safe taxi speed. Creates the proper tempo for control inputs. Timing is critical in a flare. When you start the flare, when you touch down, minimizes floats. Next slide, please. Okay. So now you're looking at these guys that they're at 2,000 feet. They're on their way down the gun. They're pointed at the runway. 
This is what the PFD showed, which is what we saw earlier. Slightly left of course, slightly below glide path, on rough, fully configured, geared down, flaps in the landing configuration. Side picture shows Bing Hampton right there. It's landing on runway 34. These guys are set up for a nice approach right here. Next slide, please. Proper input techniques are necessary to create a proper side picture. Prompt corrective control inputs may be necessary depending on wind gusts. Don't slot flying the airplane. When in doubt, go around. Next. Flare and roll out. Flying the airplane to a stop. Keep going. Okay. Here they are, very short final. They've just crossed the airport fence right here. Power's already coming back. You can already see the needles on the uh, engine indication system making their way down. Following conditions are assumed. It's fully configured, stabilized approach, rough with M5. Pilot begins pulling that power to idle. It should be at 50 feet, full idle, on ref. And there is an auto alert that'll say 50. Pilot waits to begin flare until 15 to 20 feet AGL. Using useful visual indicators of the aiming point marker. So uh, I think this one zooms in. Next. Nope, head back. All right. Everybody can see the runway right here, correct? For the pilots that are not in the room, what we have here, this big gray area is what we call the EMAS, Engineered uh, Material Arresting System, a displaced threshold, and then these stripes are the threshold of the runway. These two large rectangles way up here are your aiming point markers. Continue. Okay. Wings level throughout the flare and the rollout. When you have your control inputs in during the rollout, you cannot take those inputs out. The upwind wing will come up on you in heavy crosswinds. It absolutely will come up on you. Now you start getting the teeter-totter effect and it could have an adverse effect on your braking action. Should the pilot flying fail to maintain wings level, that's what starts the pilot-induced oscillations. This will create a tendency to want to apply asymmetric braking, which we already know we can't do. I personally teach a mantra, technique only, once on, never off. Once you apply those brakes, every bone in your body, when, those, when, the, when the wheels start providing feedback, tells you to come off the brakes. Have to trust the system. It works, especially on wet runways. It works. Next slide, please. Airplane handles like a tail dragger in regard to stick and rudder skills, not a jet. Keep the stick and rudder skills sharp. How many of you hand fly all the way up to RVSM? Well, there's two, two. Come on, Josh, come on. I expected more from you, sir. Age of 58, I'm going to let you up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hand fly as much as you can and as often as you can. Feel the aircraft. I have to tell people it often takes four seasons to get to know an airplane really, really well. You get to know how it flies in cold, you get to know how it flies in hot, but you get to feel the airplane. I think that is something that as we get more and more technically advanced, we become more systems managers than we do aviators. Sometimes it has to go back to the basics of being a good stick and rudder pilot. Under no circumstances a pilot ever remove crosswind control inputs, the upwind wing will begin to lift. Proper side picture allows for equal weight and pressure to be applied to the main wheels, thereby creating maximum effective braking efficiency. When I touch down and that nose wheel comes down and I get that steering and I apply brakes, I actually start pulling back into my chest. The reason I do that, it ensures equal weight distribution on both main landing gear wheels. I don't have to worry about the pilot induced oscillations with that because I know both brakes are working. Next slide, please. That's all I have for now. Before I go into my Q&A session, there's a few acknowledgments that I want to get to. Uh, is he still in here? He went outside. Well, Matt went outside, but a big thanks to the Velado Senior Leadership Team for, first off, sponsoring this. Mr. Patrick Moran, his unwavering commitment to safety. Uh, it's been a decades-long endeavor, if you're about to find out. 
Mr. Josh Neustadt, our fearless leader, our VP of flight operations, and um, his continued guidance. He's also probably the walking repository of aviation knowledge, which we like. Azim Samar, friend, mentor, brother, and he's the first person that I got to learn the Honda Jet from. First person I flew in the Honda Jet with was Azim. Uh, Brienne Krupa, are you here? Hello, hi. Uh, her and her team, in the myriad of demands that they have to put up with from us as the pilots, cannot be understated. They pull off miracles on a daily basis. And then for everybody here, Thank you all for being here and being part of this discussion. It really. Steve Brady. Oh. Mr. Steve? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Steve Brady is also one of our consultants. He worked for the FAA for a very long and storied service. Everybody usually likes to joke that there is a, uh, uh, you know, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Steve Brady was the first person that I met that actually means that. He really does try to help. Uh, he did, as I said, he sat in on my initial typewriter. He was also the person that trained me how to be a check airman and to do it right. Um, and Steve, your guidance, we can't, the, the, we can't put a value on it. You're very welcome. For everybody else being here, thank you so much. Again, your inputs, your contributions, what you bring to the Honda Jet ecosystem, thank you very, very much. So uh, round of applause to all of you. And then uh, again, questions before I wrap it up. I think I got, uh, what, 10 minutes or so, and then that's all I have. So questions? I know you have them. Open floor. Okay. Sir. I think we have to call an audible on the, the Q&A, but I do want to, because the NTSC is here, we have to write ah, it in uh, gotcha. on schedule. But I, I wanted to make a point uh, halfway through JP's presentation, the slide that we Thank you all for your time and your attention. Thank you so much.